During the summer of 1988, the long-standing conflict between Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and the Vatican came to a spectacular close. In open defiance of the Vatican authorities, Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated four traditional Catholic bishops. He was immediately excommunicated, and the international press accused him of creating the first schism within the Catholic Church in over 100 years. The overwhelming and overriding issue which emerged from this was one of obedience. Trad traditionalists argue that obedience compels them to reject Vatican II and to maintain loyalty to Catholic tradition. The Catholic hierarchy, on the other hand, argues that obedience is a tradition as well and that they must obey. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. We are continuing our series on the crisis in the church by considering the issue of obedience. With us are two priests who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively and reject the Second Vatican Council and its consequences. Father Clarence Kelly is Superior of Society of St. Pius V, an association of traditional Catholic priests who bring the Latin Mass to the faithful from New York to California. Father Kelly is also the superior of a congregation of nuns, in, traditional Catholic nuns in Round Top, New York. Father Donald Sanborn is also with us. Father Sanborn was formerly the head or the rector of the Seminary of St. Thomas Aquinas in Richfield, Connecticut. Father Sanborn is currently pastor of St. Pius X Church in Warren, Michigan. And in addition, he is chaplain general of Catholic Men for Christ the King, an organization of Catholic laymen seeking to reestablish the kingship of Christ in society. Father Kelly, welcome back to What Catholics Believe. Happy to be back. Father Sanborn, nice to have you Thank with you us Jesus. as well. Uh, perhaps many of our listeners are not aware that in order to, for a priest to preach in a diocese, in order to hear confessions, in order to build a church, in order to say mass, in order to lead processions, he needs the explicit approval of the local bishop. Now, it is my understanding, Reverend Fathers, that you've s led rosary processions, say, in Cincinnati and other cities, that you come in, you say mass, you preach, you hear confession, you, you build churches, and in not one instance have you received the permission of the local bishop. Moreover, in almost every instance, the local bishop has warned his flock to stay away from you, that you lack proper authorization and you are not in union with Rome. How can you justify your actions if you claim to be loyal to tradition? Well, in order to answer what is uh, clearly a very uh, difficult question, uh, and very paradoxical, by the way, you have to understand certain things. You have to understand, first of all, that the Roman Catholic Church is not uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, in the Soviet Union, the rule of the dictator and the rule of the Central Committee is the voice of God. Whatever they say is right, and whatever they say is true. Uh, Stalin was good years ago. Stalin is bad today. Uh, Brezhnev was good years ago. He is bad today. Everybody is expected to agree with that. If you don't agree with it, you're disobedient to the party. The Roman Catholic Church is not that way. The Roman Catholic Church is a divine institution established by Jesus Christ, and it is based upon the truth, and those who possess authority in the Roman Catholic Church rule in the place of Christ, and they must rule according to the laws of Christ. Now, one of the things that Catholics are obliged to be is obedient. But Obedience, again, is not bl the blind obedience of the Soviet Union. It is an obedience according to the divine law. So, for example, the virtue of obedience is a virtue, according to the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, which lies in the middle between two abuses. One abuse would be a disobedience to a legitimate command of a legitimate superior, but the other abuse of the virtue of obedience would be servile submission to an illegitimate command or an illegitimate superior. And so Roman Catholics must determine whether or not, in this particular case, the commands they are receiving are legitimate commands. 
And what we are saying is that the use of authority by the modern hierarchy to exclude uh, Catholic practices is an illegitimate command. And so a bishop does not have the right uh, in the, in, uh, under the guise of obedience to compel people to accept uh, a new religion. Father Kelly, let me ask you this. Uh, the issue seems to be then that you have determined that you are not going to obey certain commands. Uh, you are in an overwhelming minority. What makes you think that you are right? Or some would even ask you, what authority, what authorizes you to do this? OK, again, to, uh, to put it in the proper context, you must make a distinction between the kinds of law that actually do exist. There is, for example, the divine law, and uh, there is the natural law, and there is uh, human law. Now, human law is made by legitimate authority in the state and also by legitimate authority in the church. Those who make laws in the state and those who make laws in the church must conform their laws to the divine law. So, for example, in the United States of America, abortion, which is the, the murder of unborn children, is legal. But people are obliged to oppose that because it is contrary to the divine law. And therefore, if a lower law is in conflict with a higher law, the higher law is the law which takes uh, precedence. Now, uh, in, in the case of the laws that you cited, we, we could not argue that those are bad laws because they're good laws. Those laws were made by the church in former days to protect the people so that priests would teach sound Catholic teaching that they would instruct the people in a proper uh, and objective and Catholic morality. But uh, another principle comes into play, and that is the principle that the law is an ordinance of reason which is made for a particular purpose. So all of those laws were made by the church in the past, let's say, for a good purpose, to protect the church, to protect the people. Now you have a situation in which bishops are appealing to those laws in order to frustrate the purpose of those laws. So for example, the Bishop of Cleveland might say, you cannot preach in this diocese because the law forbids it. My answer to that is, the law was made to ensure that the people would receive sound Catholic doctrine, proper Catholic moral teaching. And now you are trying to use that law to exclude sound Catholic teaching and proper Catholic morality and to impose upon the people false teaching. Now, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, again, the great, uh, the angelic doctor, he says that when someone in a position of authority enforces the letter of the law in order to frustrate the purpose of the law, that that person is disobedient. And that's what the bishops are doing. Uh, without trying to overstate the case, they are, in my opinion, a 20th century version of the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees at the time of Christ, they enforced what were merely human rules and human regulations in order to subvert and to destroy the laws of God. And our blessed Lord was very, very harsh with that. Uh, one example would be the, the fourth commandment of God says, honor thy father and thy mother. And the scribes and Pharisees said that if you give us your money, you don't have to support your families. And so what they did was they used their positions of authority and they used the cover of the law in order to frustrate the divine plan. And that's what they are doing, the hierarchy of the church today. Father Kelly, assuming what you say sounds very reasonable, and I think it does, but the question which then arises is how is a layman expected to judge these things when he was been entrusted to the care of bishops and hierarchs whose purpose is to see to the salvation of their souls. These bishops and other teachers have advanced degrees in theology. They have consecrated their entire lives to work for the church. And now the layman who does not have this background in education and level of commitment is supposed to judge their actions. How could God expect a layman to make such a decision, make such a distinction? Because you don't have to be a theologian to know what the Catholic faith is. All you have to do is know your catechism. Uh, Catholic people know 
that there is something very, very wrong uh, with the way the Holy Eucharist is treated. They just know that it's wrong. All they have to do is go back to their catechism. Uh, by way of example, you do not have to have a doctor's degree in agriculture to know a rotten apple. And the people know that this new religion, from the point of view of the Catholic religion, is a rotten apple. It's just that they are being coerced by the abuse of authority on the part of the bishops into eating that rotten apple. But may I also say that our Lord himself warned that there would be false shepherds. And he said that the way in which you would know them is by their fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. You don't have to be a theologian to see that the result of Vatican II is a disaster in the Catholic Church and a substantial alteration of the Catholic faith. But this, again, brings up another question, Reverend Fathers. You're saying that uh, there will be false shepherds. Our Lord himself said that. But my question then is, how can so many be wrong and so few be right? It would seem that if you stick with the body of Catholics, you should be protected from this. St. Athanasius was virtually the single bishop at the time of the Arian heresy in the fourth century that resisted the heresy, and almost the whole episcopate was against him in resisting the heresy that Christ is not God. And he said, even if it comes down to Athanasius against the world, then it will be Athanasius against the world. Hmm. The numbers, as you know, as everyone know, ha knows, has nothing to do with truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we really were to examine numbers and truth, we would see that truth usually loses, as most of the people in this world do not believe what they should believe. In other words, in terms of a practical principle, that might work if you are not living in a crisis situation, if you had uh, priests and bishops who were loyal to the Catholic faith, then you could probably uh, follow that principle quite safely. But uh, we just don't happen to be living in times like that. We are living in what might be the most extraordinary uh, period in the whole history of the Catholic Church. Our Lord did say that there would be a great falling away. Uh, we are perhaps in, in the first stages of that. So the fact that it has happened uh, proves its possibility as well as the reference to it by our Lord and also by uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, I also point out that in Reformation England that there was one single bishop who remained faithful to the church and all the other bishops to a man defected even though they knew uh, from that one bishop who was very vocal about Henry VIII's divorce that they would be defecting from the Catholic faith if they would pursue that. Only one resisted and only a few lay people resisted and uh, of the whole Carthusian monastery in London, only two resisted, two priests resisted and went to the scaffold. I would raise this obje objection to your example, Father. In this case, these priests clearly were breaking with Rome, whereas the one who was loyal, and I believe it was St. John Fisher, mm -hmm. he was not breaking with Rome. How can you apply it to this case? These bishops say you're breaking with Rome. Yes, but your question was, was not that. Your question was, how is it possible for so many to be wrong and so few to be right? The example that Father Samuel gave demonstrates that. Mm -hmm. Another objection uh, that I could see being raised, and in fact is often raised, is that we are taught that the Church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. By your actions, they would say, you are disrupting and breaking this unity. If you're talking about the unity of the Catholic Church, if you apply that to the new church, it, it becomes absolutely ridiculous. If you go to your average parish, you could be sitting next to someone who believes in abortion, believes in birth control, believes in, in uh, perversions. I mean, there is absolutely no unity of faith. There is no unity of worship. You don't know if the priest is going to come out in a butterfly outfit or with, with a football helmet on or, or in some other get-up. The, the worship of the Catholic Church is completely disunified. The government is completely disunified. You can do virtually whatever you want except adhere to tradition. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that you can't do. 
but it's, it's a free-for-all with regard to the discipline of the Catholic Church. The, the Church is in a, a shambles with regard to unity. So don't accuse us of breaking up the unity of the Catholic <laughs> Church. Uh, it's, uh, we are adhering to the unity of the Catholic Church because we are united with the millions of Catholics, popes, bishops, and lay people, priests, all throughout the ages, who practice the same faith and believe the same things that we do. We're talking to what? Fathers Kelly and Sanborn today. We're discussing the question of obedience from the point of view of tradition. How can priests who are traditional say the traditional Mass and do what they do without being disobedient? I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. Father Kelly, you were saying. Yes, I was going to sort of uh, turn the tables on you uh, in the sense that uh, if the bishops are right today, if this new religion is something that Catholics should embrace, then the, the underlying uh, proposition is that uh, they have been wrong in the past, you see? And uh, we sort of switch it around and say, how could Pope Pius IX be wrong? How could Gregory XVI be wrong? And Pius, St. Pius X and uh, Pius XI, how could they be wrong? How could uh, St. Thomas More be wrong? St. John Fisher be wrong? How could the apostles be wrong? How can we abandon 2,000 years of Catholic teaching and Catholic truth in favor of uh, 25 years of rebellion and disintegration? See, they would disagree with you. They would say they're not wrong. We're not doing any, anything that's really different. It's just somewhat, just changing, not changing anything essential, but just applying it to different circumstances. Well, then you're not listening to what we've been saying right. because clearly they have a different standard of truth, what mm -hmm. they believe. We do not believe what they believe. They have a different standard of morality, and their concept of worship is radically different. Well, Father Sam, that, that's the crucial point. Whether the Vatican II changes are merely changes in form with the same religion, or if the, Vatican's, the Second Vatican Council and its aftermath has produced a new religion. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. And our point here is that by citing new doctrines, new morality, new worship, uh, new disciplines, that we are looking at a substantially new religion and that all Catholics must resist this new religion in order to remain Catholic and unified with all of the saints and popes and all of the Catholics of the past all the way to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that they can survive. Father That's Sam our point. And I'll yeah. tell you something interesting that Pius X said to a modernist who uh, the modernists were people in the church at his time, the turn of the century, who wanted to see these very reforms that we have today. And he, of course, uh, condemned their movement and, and uh, removed many of them from the Catholic Church. He said to one of them, if you reform the church the way you want it, the Catholics will leave it. Hmm. Father Sam, that's what we're doing. <laughs> getting back Not leaving the no, true church, no. though, leaving this false, new, 25-year-old religion. Father Sanborn, you mentioned, and I'd like to clarify this, that uh, priests uh, gets in a butterfly outfit or says mass with a football helmet. Are you being facetious? Are you using this as a figure, or is These this a true thing? These are real cases from true eyewitnesses. Uh, they have been in newspapers. There is a priest uh, in, the, in the area of Cleveland, Ohio, who says mass occasionally with a football helmet on and says at the end of every sermon, go Browns. <laughs> and then I know of people in California who were attending Mass on Easter Sunday, and the priest emerged in a cocoon outfit from the sacristy and then unzipped the cocoon and was a butterfly. And then he, he flapped his wings around the sanctuary, ran around the sanctuary as a butterfly. Hmm. And this was Easter Sunday. And ironically, they had non-Catholic friends, Episcopalian friends with them, and they said, is this the normal liturgy <laughs> that you have at your Catholic Church? I mean, who wants to be involved in that? Who wants to say, this is my faith and my religion, mm -hmm. when you see the priest in the butterfly outfit? Yeah. I mean, you would have to be crazy yeah. to say that that's the religion of our Lord Jesus Christ hmm. when he's flapping his wings. Or those who tolerate it. Is that the religion of our Lord Jesus Christ? Huh. Fathers, the, uh, probably the strongest and most difficult criticism that you are stung by 
is the fact that the local bishops will say you are not in union with Rome, you are not under the Pope. Wh what's the story with this? I mean, is this true? Well, it, it's not true in the sense that uh, they try to imply that it's true. Uh, it's only true in the sense that uh, in order to be faithful to the Roman Catholic faith and the infallible teachings of the popes, it is necessary to resist these changes. And as St. Robert Bellarmine said, he said that it would be lawful, for example, to resist a pope who tried to inflict physical harm on you, and therefore it would also be lawful to one who's trying to inflict spiritual harm on you. So th it's, it's not really a question of us against the pope. It's a question of uh, uh, are the changes which have been introduced by Paul VI and John Paul II, uh, which none of which were introduced with any pretext of infallibility, were, are those changes reconcilable with the infallible teaching of past popes? And the answer is they are not, no. My, my question, and I think this is something which naturally arises from this, is uh, given that the church was established by Christ himself and that we have these familiar statements which are almost axioms that in a time of crisis stand with the Bishop of Rome. Uh, where there is Peter, there is my church, so on and so forth. You seem to be saying, yes, that's true, but St. Robert Bellarmine said this and this. How is the average Catholic supposed to decide this? It, it's undeniable that the post-Vatican II popes are at the spearhead of these reforms. And then the they get involved in the whole question of the reform. If, if the reform is something which is alien to the Catholic Church, then they themselves uh, are at the spearhead of something that is alien to the Catholic Church. If Catholics must resist the reforms in order to be Catholic, then automatically and logically they must resist these men who are trying to perpetrate these reforms. The question is, is it irreconcilable with Catholic doctrine that a particular pope is not indefectible or is impeccable. Uh, it is not the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that popes are either impeccable or are incapable of defecting from Christ. It's just a fact. Even St. Peter, after his conversion, uh, because of human respect, was giving a bad example to the Catholics at Antioch. He refused to eat at the table with the convert Gentiles. And because he was the head of the church and the vicar of Christ, uh, others followed his example and they uh, interpreted his action as almost a doctrinal teaching. And so the apostle Paul, we know from sacred scripture, resisted Peter to his face. But because Peter uh, was a, a good and holy pope, he, uh, of course, uh, changed the wrong that he was doing. So, so the point is that. Uh, the, there must be a distinction made between the role of our Lord and the role of the Pope. Uh, the Pope is absolutely and undeniably the visible head of the church. He possesses universal jurisdiction over the whole church. But he represents uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the, the actual living head of the church. He is the ambassador of Christ. He is the representative of Christ. He must represent Christ and the interest of Christ. Uh, and if the ambassador is not as faithful as he should be to the king who sent him, then surely you must follow the king and not the ambassador. Aren't you putting the Catholic layman in a very difficult position? You're saying you must choose between what we're saying and with practically the whole body of the church, including John Paul II. We're saying, saying that you must choose between what the church is saying and what this new religion is saying. Hmm. The church being the church of all time and all ages, and this new phony religion that has come out of Vatican II. That's what we're saying. I would also want to point out that in the seventh century, there was a pope who was actually excommunicated by the church by a subsequent council. Hmm. And the acts of this council were confirmed by the reigning pontiff, who was a saint. And this pope, I'm referring to Honorius, did much less than what Paul VI and John Paul II have done with regard to damaging the faith. He merely wrote two letters that could have been interpreted as favorable to heresy. Mm -hmm. And for that he was excommunicated, 
and the popes for 400 years had to swear an oath against him. Fathers, how would you see the resolution of the situation? It seems what you describe is so fantastic that people could hardly conceive that it could happen. Well, the way I look at it is this. Uh, imagine living in a major city uh, on which uh, an atomic bomb has been dropped. And after the bomb has been dropped, there is widespread destruction and universal chaos. And what the survivors would do is they would simply hold on to the things which were necessary for them to remain alive uh, and to remain secure. And that's what Roman Catholics must do. Go back to your catechism. Hold on to the catechism. Don't change anything until our Lord restores a normal situation to the church. Fathers Kelly and Sanborn.